Hello and welcome to the January edition of MyTechU. It's 2018 and today we're going to be talking about software as a service. So our MyTechU is a monthly educational series uh, for technology and business topics. Uh, my name is Nathan Austin and I'll be your moderator today. <clears throat> this month, as I mentioned, we'll be holding a panel discussion uh, on the topic of software as a service or SaaS, um, the good, bad, and ugly. Um, we are fortunate to have three panelists with us today who are going to share their individual stories uh, and individual experience relative to today's topic. I'm excited about that. But before we turn the presentation over to our panel, uh, a couple notes uh, for the audience. Um, thank you for joining us today. First of all, uh, this presentation is being recorded and we'll actually have it available on our website within 24 hours after the presentation. Uh, so you can forward it on or send it to others if you feel it's applicable um, or watch it again or go back and reference it. I know I do that from time to time. Um, the audience is on mute. However, if you do have a question, and by all means, if you do, please ask it, um, please use the question section of the GoToWebinar control panel, and uh, we will do our best to interject the question either into the conversation, uh, or if it's a question that might be uh, better handled offline, we'll, we'll follow up with you offline afterwards. Um, with that said, uh, to our esteemed panel, uh, please introduce yourself, and let's kick off the discussion. Anna, please start it. Please get, get started. Sure. Uh, my name is Anna Brazy. Uh, I'm the Director of Development and Marketing at Cookie Cart. Cookie Cart is a nonprofit organization that teaches life and leadership skills to teens. So we use um, uh, software to track data from donations to uh, volunteers to cookie sales. Um, and I've been here about seven years and implemented our first software as a service uh, back in 2012. Awesome. Thank Hi, you, Anna. Sorry. Oh, good, Beth. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Beth Irwin. I'm the director of operations uh, for Colorado Kidney Care. We're a large uh, private medical practice of 35 physicians that are uh, kidney specialists, um, and uh, we've gone through many iterations of um, electronic medical record systems in the 16 years that I've been here. Um, and seen a lot of change in the industry. Uh, most recently, in the last um, seven, eight years, we moved from being completely hosting our own servers at a location in one of our offices to uh, a co-location uh, virtual server hosting to now we are completely cloud-based with having our EMR company um, hosting. So a lot of different changes, a lot of different uh, scenarios to walk through. Awesome, thanks Beth. Merlin? Uh, hi, Merlin Schweiger. I'm the Director of Solution Design at PowerObjects. Um, PowerObjects is a uh, Microsoft Dynamics 365 partner, um, and I've actually been a consultant with the Microsoft Dynamics uh, CRM product before, now 365, for um, a little bit over a decade. So I've seen a lot of transition from mostly being uh, reliant on on-prem environments uh, to now really pushing uh, cloud and SaaS-based offerings from Microsoft. Uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, so most of my experience is uh, working with other customers and kind of helping them uh, make that transition. Wonderful. Uh, thank you all, uh, the three of you, for introducing yourselves and giving us a little background and history. Um, so for the audience to think about um, questions if you uh, relative to the respective experiences we go through. Um, but uh, let's start it off. I have a starter question just to get the conversation going, and uh, we'll go in the same order. So we'll start with uh, uh, Ann, I'll put you on the spot, and then we'll, uh, Beth and Merlin, and, and uh, after, after this first question, we'll kind of do a little bit more free form, but um, start it off. Um, what is or, or was the most uh, memorable part of your experience uh, in moving to or, or leveraging the SaaS solution? Um, it doesn't have to be uh, doesn't have to be the, a good experience or memorable. It could be well, whatever, right? So, but what, what's kind of the, mo the thing that sticks out in your mind the most about um, some of the, your experience of making the, the transition to a, a SaaS model? Okay, well, um, I, I guess I kind of have two, and I'll I'll talk a little bit about why. But uh, I think uh, I came into this nonprofit. We didn't really have any sort of um, database solution, and we definitely didn't have anything that everyone was using. It's something that one person was using. So uh, I'll say that to to watch the implementation of what our first our first solution was was Salesforce.com. Uh, to watch that implementation through our organization was super exciting because um, we were able to put all areas of our organization in one place. So we put fundraising there, we put cookie sales there, we put 
youth outcomes there. Um, and so we were finally able to paint a really cool picture of what we were doing. Uh, so uh, that was an awesome feeling, but I would say the most memorable, memorable part uh, of that whole process was exiting the Salesforce platform. So I recently moved from salesforce.com to a smaller um, um, CRM kind of system called Live Impact and um, getting my data out of that uh, software as a service solution was really challenging for us, stretched us in a lot of ways. And I think we're still sort of tying up loose ends on that project. So. Um, it's memorable because it's fresh and it's memorable because it was just something we never really anticipated being difficult when we went into it. So I think that's my example. Uh, that's a great example. Um, uh, we'll, we'll come back to that later. So Beth, what about you? Um, I would say for us, ours was kind of uh, uh, two-phased because we sort of had the phase of, of going to a, a co-location first and then moving fully to cloud. So I'll kind of walk through those two scenarios. Um, as a practice, um, I would say that we're pretty uh, foot forward on technology and the use of technology. And so we've actually had an electronic medical record system of some sort in our practice for close to 20 years. And so, um, you know, we've seen the progression of those types of um, software programs and their ability to um, uh, communicate with other systems as well as live in other environments other than just a server in your own closet. So um, when we first had um, the, the, the thought of not having to maintain all of our own servers, our company at that point had grown to um, six offices across the Denver area and you know managing all of that and all the, the software hardware that you need at each site as well as your main server um, for a company our size was becoming super expensive um, and all of the entities involved and the vendors involved um, between you know an IT person the ISP server um, vendor and all of that was getting logistically um, expensive and challenging. So um, at that time, um, we went to our IT vendor and talked to them about the option of going to a co-location, which meant that we didn't have to keep maintaining and buying new servers, updating all the software and all that, which was getting extremely expensive. Um, the co-location um, would handle all that and um, then MyTech helped us um, with managing our, our information on our, our database there. So that first step was super helpful for us, and I'm glad we kind of did that as an intermediary step, um, having you know run everything on our own servers before. That helped us kind of understand that. Um, some of the challenges we had with that were um, backups um, and making sure that we had appropriate backups. Um, of all of our database all the time. Um, there are some colos you'll find um, provide those services, some don't. Um, it was a little tricky. Um, and also, um, when you partner with a colocation, um, you're usually doing that at the um, suggestion of your IT vendor or others, and you don't necessarily, unless you're a techie person, know those folks. So um, sometimes you can get, and we did, and this is one of our memorable experiences, <laughs> ended up partnering with a, um, a vendor that ultimately wasn't keeping up um, on their all of their technology. I think that was their cost-saving measure, so that was a learning curve for us. Um, so you need to be sure on how long of an agreement you get into with these folks, uh, because ultimately, if they end up not being a good partner, it's really difficult to extract yourself from them um, sooner than your agreement allows. And so ultimately, um, we wanted to go to a cloud-based system probably sooner than we did. Honestly, the EMR companies have been slow um, to get a um, uh, a cloud solution in place that um, had the speed and the connectivity um, that a group with multiple locations that has a lot of remote users and stuff um, that was consistent and reliable. Um, and so what we did for our EMR system was we went to the users conference every year and usually three of us went um, on our exec team and we would plan
plunk ourselves down next to lots of other users from lots of other medical groups all over the country that were big and then we pepper them if they were cloud hosting with all the lots of questions to find out from real users what their experience was and until we really started hearing consistently that people on the cloud were having a really good solid experience we didn't move so that was honestly the deciding factor for us as well as our colo agreement coming up. And so we just moved in the last year over to cloud hosting. Um, it's been great um, experience. Um, it removed one more vendor from the puzzle and that we don't have to have the co-location folks anymore. Um, and we already had our EMR folks as a vendor that we had to deal with. And now the other thing that's nice for us is that patches, upgrades, all that stuff is done on the fly. Um, and it doesn't have to you know, you don't have to have something loaded on every computer. Um, you don't have to have your IT folks doing tons of work on your server at night and hope that everything goes well the next morning. So, so far it's been pretty seamless and, and, and good. And so um, we've had a good experience, um, but it's been interesting to see the progression over time of these services. Well, Beth, uh, one of the reasons why, um, thank you for sharing that, because one of the reasons why I thought of you when I thought about this panel was because um, I didn't know some of the history you just mentioned, um, but I knew that um, I, I remember you telling the story of how you were very intent, like you wanted to go SAS, right? You, you, you were like, we're ready to go, but um, you, you basically had to wait until the, the, the software that you were using was ready. Um, and, and I liked how your approach, again, you mentioned so many good little nuggets of information there that I don't want to lose. So forgive me for interjecting, Merlin, give me a second here. Um, but talking about, you know, um, the backup and making sure that that's critical because a lot of people presume that backups are always done in the cloud just because it's cloud and that's not always the case. Um, you mentioned that um, making sure that you keep tabs on your IT partner. You know, one of the things that um, uh, that people oftentimes uh, don't look at from a strategic risk management perspective for their business is who are your key vendor partners and what are the risks if they're not doing their job? Um, and you mentioned that about your IT partner and how that, you know, that, that, that I think created some anxiety for you. Um, and the last thing that was huge, and I and I wish I wish more um, people would do this, um, is is you, you mentioned going to user conferences and peer groups, like talking to your peers, um, talking to companies that are doing similar things, and finding out the real story behind the scenes, um, and uh, all of that combined. Um, and then the last thing, Beth, you mentioned that uh, for the context of people either listening now or listening in the future, you mentioned that um, your organization, Color Kidney Care, has had um, uh, been on an EMR for around 20 years, which is at least double the amount of time that most medical practices have been on some sort of electronic medical records. Um, really, EMR didn't come out until 2007, 2008 as a major push from uh, across the medical industry. And so, um, that, so I commend them. There's, there's you know, a ton of experience and wealth of knowledge, uh, um, Beth, with your experience. So thank you again for participating and sharing some of those, those nuggets that I didn't want to lose uh, with, with what you mentioned there. So, uh, but we'll get into more of that later. Uh, Merlin, can you uh, tell us a little bit about, like, I know that you don't have a direct experience from, a, you know, your organization because you work with a lot of other organizations. So can you tell us maybe a memorable story of, um, from, a, from a transition that, that, um, that, I don't know, that sticks out to you? Yeah, so um, actually I was, I was going to say probably my most memorable uh, thing is kind of ties into what Beth was just saying, where kind of watching the transition um, in the industry that I'm in. So uh, like I said, I've been working with the Microsoft CRM product for a little over a decade. And in that time, um, it's definitely gone from an application that you had to run on-premise um, to an application where you had the option to put it in the cloud or keep it on-prem. Um, and there was a long time there where, you know, Microsoft had it as an offering available online. Um, and as a consultant, I would always say, no, no, you don't, you don't want to do that. It's too limiting. It's way better to have control over your own uh, systems and your own applications uh, to now where I'm at a point where um, the application has developed so much and the offering that Microsoft is providing around it has evolved so far um, that now I'm in exactly the opposite situation where I'm saying, you know, why, why would you keep this on-prem when you, when you could go to the cloud and take advantage of all these uh, of all these great features and tools, because now uh, I'm in an interesting situation where Microsoft is releasing all of their newest features only to their online uh, environment. So people who are on-premise uh, are actually kind of being left behind and not getting the newest features. Um, and so that's, uh, I don't know, it's, it's been very interesting to watch that transition uh, across the industry and 
and kind of within my own uh, advice to, to go from telling people that they should really stay on-prem and, and retain control um, to now saying there's there's no reason to keep it on-prem. Um, uh, I, I think a, a prime example of that kind of going to the, the backups and disaster recovery idea is, um, so if I'm hosting something, and this could be um, something that's just hosted within, you know, Azure as as a infrastructure as a service as well as as something like Dynamics 365, which is just software as a service. Um, if you look at kind of the the backup scenarios that Microsoft provides in their data centers, um, I mean they've got uh, so a data center on the west coast, a data center on the east coast. They're replicating data between them. Um, if California falls off into the Pacific Ocean. Um, within a couple minutes time, your organization will be back up and running with essentially no data loss off the East Coast data center. Um, and that's just crazy to me because how could you, if you were running your own servers and had them you know, either in your office or even at a co-location, um, in order to provide that level of backup and disaster recovery, it, it would be almost cost prohibitive. Um, whereas you know, included in your monthly subscription fee, uh, Microsoft is providing that. So I just, I don't know, I think it's been, uh, an interesting time in, in IT to kind of watch that transition and, and go from uh, a time when on-prem was clearly the, the choice to now when I think it's uh, it's probably more clearly the other way. Yeah, Merlin, I appreciate that. There's a couple nuggets that you mentioned there that I that I want to highlight, um, and and especially because um, I was just having a conversation with one of our clients um, in in Minnesota here that had a CRM on and in fact Microsoft CRM on premise um, and is moving to uh, Microsoft hosted online as well using, using the Dynamics um, solution. And um, three years ago, um, when we were talking about making an investment and should they do host it or not, we were in the same spot and we we're saying, you know what? What I hear, we're not CRM experts like you are. Um, from what I hear, it's not ready yet. It's not feature rich. It's it, it doesn't. It's like no, it's not quite ready. But now, and and this doesn't necessarily apply. And kind of the best comments as well. This doesn't necessarily apply to every software or every industry, but now it's I, I, I challenge any um, nonprofit or for-profit business um, when they're looking at their software application or if they need to make a change that you almost should ask yourself um, you should challenge yourself for reasons why you shouldn't be in the cloud as opposed to trying to think of reasons why you should be in the cloud um, because of all the benefits you're just talking about really comparing apples to apples you can't it's cost prohibitive for any small business to pay for the level of redundancy uh, and feature set that you get, in the, for the most part, uh, when you go to a SaaS, SaaS model. Um, and I think that that, this, that definitely has evolved, and I think that's an awareness that um, it's important, I think, to get that message out there. So I really appreciate you bringing that up. Um, so, okay, uh, so now um, I wanna move on to the next question, um, because I, I really wanna say that, like, making this transition um, to, this, to this, the SaaS model, um, is there anything that looking back, um, if you were to do it again, um, you know, and Beth, I, I want to start with you. So I'm going to, I'm going to let you know, I'm going to start with you. Um, because it, it, in particular, you mentioned something, uh, in your story that you, you were glad you took this intermediary step, right? You were glad that you, that you had the opportunity to experience that because I kind of gave you some unique perspective. So, so looking back, uh, is there anything that you would recommend to others to do differently, uh, or w what would you do differently if you had to do it all over again? So, um, Beth, can you tell us uh, that, what, what that what that might spark ideas that might spark? Sure. Um, obviously, I think every business and the applications they use are, are different, so I can only kind of speak from our perspective of what we went through. But given that the electronic medical record industry was at times slow evolving um, <laughs> to the market and was kind of slow to um, uh, implement new features and um, applications and things like cloud hosting. Um, even though EMRs have been around a long time, like you said, um, they are notorious as an industry for being slow to um, slow to the game, so to speak, with some of their features. Um, things are getting faster now, but I think um, in that we were ready to move to a, a cloud environment of some sort sooner than our EMR vendor was. Um, uh, finding an interim solution of, of going to a colo 
cloud hosting scenario allowed us to sort of put a toe in the water um, and do so in partnership with our IT vendor, because keeping in mind, my tech was the IT vendor, um, the Colo uh, vendor was a completely secondary vendor, as well as our ISP. So it taught us a lot about how to manage all of those vendors together. Um, there was definitely some challenging times, um, and no knock on my tech, that don't hear that from me. Um, they've always been a great partner, but there, there at times gets to be a lot of finger pointing when things aren't going well. Um, and whose problem is it? Where does the solution lie? Um, and stuff like that. So, and having my tech be able to have a lot of control at the Colo um, and be able to see in to our virtual servers at the Colo, um, at times they were able to identify problems actually were with the Colo vendor that I never would have been able to identify as a non-technical person. So it laid a lot of education for us, <laughs> I guess I would say, um, in going through that whole phase um, and teaching us more about the cloud environment and the virtual environment. So when we were ready to actually move to cloud hosting with our EMR vendor, I've been, I would say I'm better educated now um, as our operations director. And so as we were getting prepped for, for that move, I felt like I had a lot more questions um, to, to ask um, and they were actually surprised that I was asking them. Um, mm -hmm. And because <laughs> a lot of people hadn't already been in such an environment before because their first move was usually that 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 direct move to the to the EMR vendor. So um, I feel I, especially with a group our size, um, you know, I think and as spread out as we are and the amount of locations we are, we have and also not everybody is using our EMR um, uh, on a desktop in a office you know we have a lot of remote users that are using them in hospitals and dialysis units on ipads you know at home all that kind of stuff so there's a lot to manage and so you've got to make sure that your cloud environment is not only strong in the sense of connectivity um, and speed and all that sort of stuff but also that you really make sure that the requirements of their system and their data center are matched up with what you have with your internet service provider your IT um, network and all that. So having all of that landscape built ahead of time and really knowing what the questions to ask and making sure that all of our vendors were in sync was key. Um, and so um, if you don't have that experience and you're gonna go straight to cloud, I would say leverage your ISP vendor and your IT vendor um, and really make sure that those two are in sync with each other before you add the third vendor into it um, so that you don't have a mess on your hands. I would say that would be our biggest learning curve. No, oh, that's that's a, a excellent advice. I think that, that that is something that, especially when, as you add in vendors, it's almost like when you if you if you have two people talking and then you add a third uh, and a fourth, it doesn't linearly increase the complexity. It exponentially increases the complexity uh, every vendor you add. So it 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 adds a lot more um, when you're trying to you know between the colo, the ISP, your IT partner, the software vendor. Um, so no, that's great advice. Um, and then the last part, I think that, that you mentioned there at the end, Beth, that, that I, again, like just saying it to illustrate and highlight and, and reinforce uh, that one of the things that's uh, sometimes overlooked when people move to a, any type of cloud, whether it's SaaS or just you know, putting their infrastructure in the cloud is the internet vendor, the ISP, is recognizing that, that now this traffic that might've existed previously between your desktop and the server in the back room, um, you know, or for in your case, the colo, but is now going across a completely different connection to a hosting environment, and what impact is that gonna have on your internet, right? How's that gonna work? Um, and for you with all those locations, how do we need to reconfigure your internet uh, uh, to make sure that that's optimized as well? So, um, like great, great, uh, great commentary. So, how about you, Anna? Um, what would you either do differently, or, because you had a unique experience going from a SaaS vendor to a SaaS vendor. Um, right. so, what can tell us some of those lessons learned and like what what would you do over again or would you do it over again uh, <laughs> uh, what would you do differently if you did it over again right well so because we so recently switched i think we still have yet to see how financially it plays out for us but i will say that uh we adopted salesforce.com as a solution early on because it was free to nonprofits so they offer their first 10 licenses free to nonprofits at the time we had five or six staff and we thought that would that would get us a long way. And um, I think, you know, my biggest 
um, regret there was that I thought it was going to be free, and it absolutely wasn't. It took a ton of my time to not only learn Salesforce, but um, understand it enough to then later direct um, consultants who helped us develop it further than I could. Um, and um, and because we went into it with a sort of free mindset, I don't think we launched it as well as we could have. So. So our our cause for the switch was that as we grew as an organization, uh, even the the licenses that we were getting for free were not making up for what it was starting to cost us. And again, we're a nonprofit. We're not um, we can't see the ROI quite as easily in these kinds of systems. So what what I recognized was a real gap in. Uh, if I uh, I don't like to say if I died tomorrow, but if I win the lottery tomorrow and I'm no longer at this nonprofit, are they going to be able to keep up to the system that they have? And and I felt that and our team felt that Salesforce was super difficult to use and super difficult to develop. So we moved to something that um, has support included. So there is a cost to our annual operating budget, which is hard to swallow when we're when we're reflecting back now on what was free. But but I think in the long run, it will be really positive for our organization. So, um, it, yeah, it is a unique position because, uh, you know, again, moving from one system to another and actually moving from something that's very robust and highly supported, but has lots of different vendors and attachments and things like that to something that is it can't do as much, but we but it but it's easier for everyone to use. Um, I think we have yet to see how that value plays out. Um, but it's it's definitely uh, that the financial component for our nonprofit has definitely been the biggest challenge for us. It's how do we sort of how do we justify that this takes money or time or both, right? Um, there's just nothing that's free in this world, right? And um, right. and how do we justify that and and prove that it's worth the investment, right? That it's actually helping us to grow. I have a follow-up question just because I know a little bit about this um, from a conversation we had um, uh, several months ago about this, Anna, but I remember talking about um, looking at the cost of the software uh, versus what you're, where you're at and where you were looking to go um, versus the cost of your team not being able to use the features because you're limited on licensing, not being able to do as much or having to, or just not, you know, because uh, mm -hmm. the cost of your people, and for this applies to any organization, is more expensive than the cost of your tools to help your people right. do their job. So right. uh, I don't know. Can you? Can you? Can you? Is there anything you can elaborate on that as far as how like that helped uh, make the decision that you made um, to empower yeah. your people? Yeah. Again, I think the the feedback we were getting from from folks on the original software system was that it was too complicated and, and again I would say at the at my level I'm not a I'm not a software person I'm a fundraiser and a marketer so I I, I learned it because I had some interest in it but it was really difficult for people to take on and and uh, so that the usability and the friendliness of things like that is is important and what again what we wanted to do was bring everybody in to the database so that we weren't having some people rely on their superiors or someone else in the organization for information or, you know, somebody be holding something in their head that they want to record and they can't do that. And I think an example of that is some of our, um, our youth program achievements. So we train teens to be great employees and to have a positive future. And so they, they work here at our bakery and they make cookies, but then they also take classes and they go on community events and they learn about careers. And we want to really track that. So when they're, when they've got all the good stuff we have to offer, we can send them on their way. And if somebody's along on one of those events or sees something happen and they can't note that, it's really hard for everyone to do their jobs well. So, so that was a huge factor in moving to this new system was staff buy-in. And, um, you know, it could be a lot of timing. I think some people will say that Salesforce new platform, the, the uh, sort of new look that they have is going to be a lot more user-friendly. And I think they hope so, but it was something our team just could not could not, you know, again, I think the, the challenge for us was there was no support, so there was no training available. And um, 
and any expert at Salesforce that we could talk to for the paid licenses we did have does, was not familiar with the nonprofit model. So it made it really hard for our nonprofit, and I would say probably for others, to, to get help. Free isn't free. That's free good. isn't free. Anna, Anna I mean, Brady, I'm going to quote that. Free, right. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right. Well, good. So uh, I have a, qu uh, a question for Merlin. Like, so Merlin, how would you, um, I know that you, you help people do this a lot. So um, I, I, can you point out like maybe one or two things that um, you've seen companies either do successful? Like what, what are the things that you've seen that, that are maybe common denominators of success or maybe some things where you've seen people really, um, you know, not do something and that really caused a painful transition happen. I don't know. From, can, can you share anything along those lines? Uh, yeah. So um, I guess a few things. Thinking specifically about um, like companies who have moved from uh, an on-prem environment to a SaaS model, uh, I think the, the biggest factor there, at least usually from my perspective, uh, unless you're you know doing a, a whole new platform change, is um, considering your data and how you're going to move the data um, from where it is sitting to where it needs to go, and then how you're going to be able to access it or consume it for any of your kind of reporting and analytics. Um, and I feel like the, the more successful organizations that make this transition smoothly are thinking not just about kind of the day-to-day -day operation, like uh, if I'm going, you know, if I'm using a, a Salesforce solution and I'm switching to a Microsoft solution or I've got something sitting on-prem and I'm moving to the cloud, but it's the same basic idea. I can I can still manage opportunities or keep track of contacts in, in either of those systems. But what else kind of surrounds that system? How is that data being kind of consumed downstream in your existing environment? And how is that going to be supported? Or how are you going to continue to access those things um, from your cloud environment? Um, I think that's that's a very important question to think about what do I need out the other side of this application, um, and how is this SaaS solution going to help support me? I think that's um, one of the the key things that I would consider. Um, one of the other things that I think uh, maybe Beth had mentioned was kind of the dealing with uh, kind of the or getting the well, actually Anna was mentioning this too the the time savings of your of your people. So um, specifically when moving from on prem to SaaS. Uh, anybody who you have internally who's managing the actual hardware environment, um, you know, those folks presumably are spending a fair amount of their time, you know, maintaining the database, maintaining the server that's providing the, the application, maintaining all of these other things. If they don't have to do any of that anymore because you've moved it all to the cloud, that frees them up to do other things, uh, maybe more uh, proactive things as opposed to, well, you know, something's always breaking, so I have to fix it. Now they can think about, all right, what do we want our infrastructure to look like? What do the users need to make their jobs easier? Um, it kind of frees up their time from break, fix, and management uh, of a system to being a little bit more proactive and forward thinking. Merlin, um, uh, thank you for those two things because. Um, that you just summarized um, it generally speaking um, a lot of the conversations we have with folks when they're looking at either like they feel like they've hit a plateau relative to how they leverage technology or they're not sure where to take the next step and so the two nuggets that I'll say that that you know uh, what the first thing you were mentioning is really uh, I like to reference Stephen Covey start with the end in mind right this this stuff is yes to help you operate but in the end you have to get metrics and data and information in order to make decisions. Um, so thinking about how that needs to look on, on the output um, helps you reverse engineer that on the input. Um, and I think that's definitely something that once people, there's, there's several times I've sat down with folks and, and when they, once they connect those dots um, and, and, and even pull the different departments and leadership people together to figure that out and actually work together on that, I, I see people's eyes just like an epiphany happens, right? It's, uh, it's, so that was a great piece of information. And the last thing I would say that you mentioned that I think was really great is um, because, um, and I know this is some work that you, Beth and Anna, you both you do in your organizations, um, is you know, when, when you can, um, uh, and what we see the most successful organizations, because we all like, you know, um, a medical practice could buy the same EMR system um, that, that Beth is using or a nonprofit 
could could leverage the same uh, live impact solution that that Anna and Cookie Hearts using. But the most successful organizations invest their time on improving the way they use those systems, not just buying the systems themselves. Um, and so, and and that's what you're saying is, can it, what what kind of else can you spend your time on if you free up your time not having to do these these hardware things and and maintaining just like maintenance stuff how can you refocus your energy on the higher and better use and more valuable use of your time to truly improve the way your organization leverages this technology so um we call that above the line uh work um uh that's kind of how we but uh, that thanks thanks for uh, those tidbits um uh, so okay um uh next question this will be the last question we're gonna have time for it's amazing how time flies uh, you guys are telling some great stories and sharing some excellent experience. Um, for for those, um, I really feel like okay. So we've talked about uh, history, experience, and making the transition. Um, now I'd like to like change your move your focus to uh, Merlin. I'm going to start with you, and then we'll go we'll go Beth and Anna. I'll reverse the order here. Uh, uh, what have you seen organizations do so they they make the transition happen? And what are some of the operational things they might do? Communication, training, whatever, to really help with the adoption and to create a successful utilization of um, the, the the software after the transition, uh, kind of post transition. Um, and some of that might have started during the transition. But if you get my point, like, what are some of the things you felt they had to do to support internally to really support the initiative to to create a successful outcome? Uh, Merlin, can can you share a story about uh, anything along those lines? Yeah, definitely. Um, and I think that's. Uh, when when Anna was telling the story about how kind of their Salesforce implementation was not a great experience, that was one of the things that I was thinking about. Um, we get into companies all the time, and you know they had a, a failed implementation of something, and then they're trying to re-implement um, on a new platform. Um, and what we try to do is caution them from deploying it the same way that they may have deployed it the last time, where they bought a solution and they were like, all right, the solution is going to provide whatever we need. Um, and I think managing the, the change management and the communication within that process is, is critical um, to make sure that users feel comfortable and feel supported um, so that they will actually use the application. So some of the things, I mean, we've actually got a, a whole change management kind of mini practice within our organization uh, that goes into different projects and kind of helps execute on this. Um, but we try to focus a lot on how can you communicate to the users what are the changes that are coming um, and give them a little bit of vested interest in that. So um, users, and I'm sure anybody who's ever been told something's changing within your organization, you feel better about that change when you know why it's happening, when you understand the timeline that it's happening on and the impact that it's going to have on you from a day-to-day -day basis. You know, Nobody likes to be blindsided by coming on Monday morning and somebody says, oh, by the way, we turned off this application you've been using and comfortable with for the last 15 years, uh, and now you're using this new system, let us know if you have questions, thanks. Uh, that user is automatically going to be on the defensive and not interested in using this new application because they don't feel like they were part of that journey and that transition. Um, so we usually advocate lots of communication kind of throughout the project. Here's what's going on. Here's where we're at. Here's our timeline. Um, these are the sorts of exciting things that you have to look forward to and try to get people a little bit interested and, uh, and sort of bought into the system. Um, and then after you've deployed the application, um, continuing to follow through and make sure that people are actually getting their hands on it and using it, um, encountering problems if they're having problems, and then bringing those problems up so that they can be solved. Uh, one of my best examples of that is um, I helped deploy to uh, actually another small nonprofit here in town that runs a homeless shelter. Um, and after they went live for the next, I don't know, two or three months at every weekly meeting, um, they would give their users some homework to do within the application. So they'd say, by this meeting next week, you need to go in and perform this function um, and make sure that you feel comfortable doing that. And then the next week, they'd come back and check up on that, say, how did everybody do? Did you encounter any problems? Has anybody encountered any, like, tips or tricks? And so their, their use of the new application was part of their ongoing meetings on a weekly basis to make sure that they were, um, you know, actually getting in and using the system and feeling comfortable with it. That's a great tip. 
thanks for that. Um, Beth, um, what, what do you, I don't know, what did you feel was a part of your success or what are the things you thought were critical to kind of getting adoption or, or a successful outcome of, of making that transition? Sure. Um, I'm going to dovetail off of both Anna and Merlin, um, and I could not agree with Merlin enough on his point about communication. Um, our mantra um, through our multiple different um, transitions um, it was over communication. <laughs> Um, you know, good, bad, and ugly, you know, even if something's, you know, not going well, not going smooth, like we actually had to move our implementation date a couple of times due to issues, you know, um, but way ahead of time, even when you're just, you know, starting to plan, loop your people in and tell them, you know, we're, uh, this is a plan, this is our, you know, our vague timeline at the moment, and tell them the why and the how, um, and so that you get buy-in ahead of time. Um, what we were able to do, because there's sort of two transitions, as Merlin alluded to, is that one, you're moving to a completely different application, which Anna also went through, um, from what you had before versus a new version or upgraded version of what you already have. So there's two different kind of paths with that. But, you know, either way, as much training as you can provide your people ahead of time, like for instance, when we switched EMRs or even went to a new version of our EMR that was going to be drastically different, we got our vendor to give us a test environment um, that, you know, didn't have real patient data, it had dummy patient data in it um, that we could use for training our people. Um, so ahead of time, we did training sessions um, and we allowed them to run around in the test environment. No, it wasn't compl as robust as, as ours was going to be, but it at least let them know how they could do their job on that Monday morning after go live. And it took the fear factor away from it, um, you know, of what does this mean to me um, and, you know, how is it going to impact my job? And then, you know, we had much more buy-in. There weren't, uh, you know, the people that were refusing to use it. Um, and and we, we kind of got rid of a lot of that pushback, so to speak. So that helped immensely. And then second, um, the second big thing um, that Anna was talking about struggling with that I think has to be identified early, early on in these processes is you have to have super users and you have to have people um, that are going to have designated time to focus on the application and to be go-to people. Um, and so those are people that are really going to know the application intimately. On our, on, in our team, for instance, we don't just have one or two, we have four because our system is huge and there's um, a lot of admin applications to it. Um, uh, and then there's provider clinical Sides to it. So we actually have two physician super users and then myself and another person who are more on the admin um, side of the system. And so we work together um, to be our super users and to champion changes and to be the leads on all of this to create our training documents. Um, because the reality is, um, you know, when you go shopping for applications, remember that they're going to tell you how great the application is and all the wonderful things it can do for your company. But the reality is nobody at any of these companies has a clue on how it's going to work for your, your company, which Anna said, you know, clearly. Um, and so if you don't have people that have the time to learn how to implement it in your company and make it work for your company and then continually improve it um, to improve your workflows, your processes and learn the system more intimately, um, then you're probably going to have a failed implementation. Um, so that, those are key, and then you could be throwing good money away um, because then if you have a failed implementation, you got to start it all over again. You've wasted a lot of money and manpower at that point. So I think those are big key things that a lot of companies, I don't care what your size is um, or what your you know, business model is, that um, they miss, um, and therefore um, they have a lot of problems. So I think those are our big key um, lessons learned. Yeah, Beth, and I, I, I couldn't agree with you more when you said um, that, that the companies, like the software provider, they know their software, but they don't know your organization, right? Mm -hmm. They have no idea all the nuances and idiosyncrasies and unique ways in which it's going to have to work for you. So um, uh, that's, uh, I love I love those tips that you're, you're giving there. So, all right, we're running a couple minutes long, but we'll just wrap up uh, with, with Anna finishing uh, what, what her secrets to success were as far as uh, having a, a positive outcome on the implementation. 
uh, and then we'll close. So Anna, can you, can you bring us home here as far as uh, uh, some of the things that you found successful uh, to post implementation or internally with your organization? Yeah, absolutely. So I couldn't, I really couldn't agree more with both what Beth said and what Merlin said about change management. So the best thing we did this time was we brought the entire team along on the process of why we were changing systems and even selecting the new system and asking ahead of time what they wanted and what they needed to do. Because again, we're growing and changing. When I started, there were five staff. Today, there's 18 staff. I mean, so everybody has different roles even then when we were at that point. So I, I, yeah, I couldn't emphasize more the need to sort of step back and ask those questions. And I will take the advice of Beth and think about who the super users are going to be, because I don't think we've actually identified that yet. And the whole goal was to say, you know, let's really say whose time this is taking up and um, and make sure they have that time in their job. Because, you know, again, this kind of fell on to somebody who was just like kind of interested in it, and then it took up more and more time. So. Um, so I, I hardly need to say anything else. You brought on really good experts, and they I think they covered the biggest things about a new system and implementing that with a with a team. Yeah, and I'll, I'll reinforce a message that you that um, uh, I think um, that I think you mentioned and maybe really mentioned too, but um, is uh, this stuff does take time, uh, and I think um, I know we've made this mistake in the past when 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 we've done new initiatives is that everyone already has a full time job. And then, oh, yeah, and you're going to do this other stuff. Uh, so um, I think uh, definitely um, helping out your team by recognizing and allocating time uh, that they need to, to, to dedicate to make this successful is, is good, too, so you won't have burnout and won't have some uh, people with uh, maybe a sour taste in their mouth uh, for all the extra effort that they're putting forward uh, for the benefit of the organization. So, um, gosh, I, uh, I, I have so many other questions that have come out of the conversation that I have prepared um, and that I would love to spend more time uh, talking to you and listening to all of you um, share your stories and experience. Uh, so I've learned a lot. I hope everyone who's listening now or in the future will as well. Uh, will have found some tidbits and nuggets of information you can you can uh, use and, and apply into your organization. Um, a couple things while we've got everybody. Um, you know we do have um, uh, that I want to mention before we finally sign off here. Uh, we do have a couple events next week. Uh, uh, the 23rd in Minnesota, the 25th in Colorado, um, where. It's going to be a very unique presentation. If you've come to our presentations before, this one's going to be completely different, um, and uh, it'll be very engaging. Uh, and you'll, it's, it's basically the whole thing is going to be a demonstration. So, um, uh, so if you can make those, I'd love to see you and have you there. Um, and then uh, we also have a uh, uh, we call it scare because we're you know we're tired this year. We're tired of security tactics or scare t security scare tactics. It seems like the the whole industry is trying to scare everyone and realizing any more security, but no one's giving you answers. Uh, so we're actually going to be that whole session is going to be about you know giving you and empowering you with answers um, so you don't have to be um, worried about or fearful of the scare tactics of things you hear on a regular basis out in the industry. So uh, with that said, Anna, Beth, Merlin, thank you very much uh, for your time and uh, sharing of your time and expertise uh, and giving us all something uh, we can take back to organizations so that we can uh, we can make transitions like this more successfully. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. All right. With that said, we're signing off. Have a great day, everyone. And um, now stay in touch for next time. Talk to you later.